Great. And uh, we, we do record our meetings, and, and, but we don't post anything unless you're okay with that. So um, some folks like to have that. We have a new YouTube page, which is very exciting. So we can post things there and link. So thanks to our president, Betsy, who set that up. So we have some speeches there. Uh, and uh, Dev will be giving um, her speech. Uh, this is her icebreaker and her evaluator is Leslie. Leslie, can you say what uh, the goals are for Dev's speech? Yes, the goals are for us to get a general idea of her um, joining Toastmasters and to learn more about her. And I know she wanted me to focus on her vocal variety and impactful pauses. And this is a four to six minute speech. So Linda, can you explain the timer code for uh, Devaki and for everybody, what to expect? Certainly. I will be flashing different color screens. When you hit four minutes, uh, I'm sorry, Devaki, I will flash the green screen. When you hit five minutes, the yellow, and when you hit seven, excuse me, six, I will flash it red and you have 30 seconds from that point on to wrap up. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. Thank you. I think we are ready to start our meeting. It is my honor to introduce Devaki Dave to share her icebreaker. Dev? Thank you. I proffer this icebreaker to the entire Toastmaster community here today. So uh, without further ado, as I savored my strawberry and powdered sugar crepe, I watched a group of Moroccan French kids burying my new friends, Maria and Kamar, with little buckets and shovels in, in the sand. And I wondered whether these kids could even begin to imagine the horrors that my friend Kamar must have gone through as a child and a refugee from Sierra Leone. I could barely imagine them myself when Kamar first told me his story. Kamar worked at the front desk of a hostel where I was staying in Marseille, where I had taken an impromptu trip after catching a really bad cold in the chilly and rainy weather up north in Paris. When I met Kamar, he seemed like any other 20-something year old working at a hostel, setting up free breakfast coffee and baguettes in the morning and helping out with errands and, and odd jobs. He spent a lot of time with Maria, a student from Venezuela, who was living and working there during the summer too. After learning that I was traveling on my own, Maria and Kamar invited me to join them for their beach day on their day off. I accepted the offer and the next morning we chatted as we walked along the cobblestone streets of the old port of Marseille. And I asked Kamar and Maria how they arrived in Marseille. Maria said she was just like the other hostel staff, another international student visiting for the summer but Kamar said he was a refugee from Sierra Leone. As we walked by picturesque cafes on a brilliant sunny day, Kamar painted a very disturbing portrait of his turbulent childhood during a brutal civil war in Sierra Leone. Kamar shared how he fled to Europe as a refugee to send money back to his family. He described a harrowing journey, maybe something I might've read about on BBC News. His harrowing journey with a seedy group of smugglers who he paid to help him cross into Europe. He shared that when he got to Libya, he boarded a crowded inflated raft and it capsized at one point, causing him to lose his ID documents and pictures of his family and his phone. And somehow he managed to tread water just long enough to stay alive until the Italian Coast Guard arrived for the survivors. Later, he was processed through different UN refugee camps and programs and ultimately settled in Marseille where he had a case manager or a social worker, things got lost in, in translation. And they helped him find a job and adjust to life in France. Kamar was surprised to learn that even though Marseille was relatively diverse, uh, refugees weren't quite accepted and he was discriminated against because of his skin color. The lighter skinned Moroccan French in Marseille tended to avoid darker skinned people like Kamar. But Kamar said overall, he was just happy to be alive and happy to be able to send money back to his family and enjoy the old city of Marseille. When Kamar finished with this story, I remember we sat down on the beach 
I was just stunned in silence, listening to the ocean and the sounds of children playing. Maria went to a crepe stand and buy us some snacks, maybe to lighten the mood. Kamar then asked about my story. How could I tell him about my struggles, which seemed pretty trivial in comparison to his? I told him I'm just a court clerk turned high school Spanish teacher, and I'm just working on healing my body and soul after a foot surgery and a rough first year as a teacher. I guess I'm just a teacher on a vacation. I remember how Kamar interrupted me and emphasized there's no such thing as just a teacher. He said if it hadn't been for his teachers, he would never have learned the little English that he knew or French. I told him how I had grown up in a traditional Indian family in a suburban Texas town where diversity wasn't always appreciated, let alone accepted. I told him I was just trying to figure out my place in an America where the nation had just elected a president whose rhetoric hurt my community and emboldened racist hate speech. Teaching seemed like a thankless job and I just didn't know if being a teacher was enough to impact the change I wanted to in my community. Feeling overwhelmed, I'd booked a trip to Paris for the summer and enrolled in French lessons while searching for a job to teach English abroad and escape the horrors of the political world in the US. It might seem sort of odd that it seems so easy for me to confide in relative strangers like Kamar and Maria, but that's kind of the magic of traveling alone and, and meeting new people. I found myself opening up to new experiences while wandering through France, often skipping tourist attractions to just go spend time with locals and, and learn about their stories. While witnessing history in the making of the mass migration of millions like Kamar relocating to Europe after the Arab Spring, I discovered a new sense of purpose. I wanted to help build a world where people aren't discriminated against for who they are or where they come from. I decided that I couldn't run away from all the work that needed to be done back home in the US to advance racial equity, especially at a time when anti-immigrant rhetoric was at an all-time high. I also knew that I probably wouldn't be satisfied living abroad, no matter how delicious the crepes are, when there was so much work to do back home. So when I got back to the US, I volunteered to teach English lessons for newcomers after school and even volunteered to translate legal documents for attorneys providing pro bono representation for refugee and immigrant clients. Meeting Kamar inspired me to reach out to different organizations in my community and get more involved in community organizing and activism. And traveling expanded my core values and beliefs and shaped a lot of who I am today. I learned just how interconnected humans are and that our future as one humanity truly depends on our ability to collaborate and coexist. To serve this larger ideal, I changed careers and I plunged into politics, working for candidates and leaders who advocated for human rights, immigrant rights, and racial equity. Even though the pandemic has interrupted my ability to travel or explore new destinations, I still engage with my friends online and spend time reflecting and writing about my travel experiences. Although I sadly lost touch with Kamar after he changed contact information and moved around Europe, one of the former hostel staff members did reach out to me a few months ago, just wanting to know where life had taken me. When I shared my career changes with him, he laughed and said, Devaki, you're a teacher, a world traveler, and now a change maker. What are you going to do next? I never know the exact answer to that question, but I do know I'll continue to follow my passion wherever it takes me. Thank you. Wow. Wow, Devaki, thank you so much for your icebreaker, a round of applause. Uh, just an amazing first speech for the club. I'm so thrilled you've joined to work with me and, and our team, but also that you've brought your insights and your leadership and you're just, you're just your compassion and your, your drive for uh, racial and social and economic justice into, into the club and into the world. So thank you for proffering such an important and timely speech. I know we all are gonna look forward to more speeches and greater participation from you at US Senate Toastmasters. So congratulations. Um, our second speaker is also a relatively new member. Uh, I'm gonna ask Jackie as his evaluator to share what some of his goals from his presentation mastery um, speech today. If there's anything in particular you wanna say, Jackie as the evaluator. Sure, sure. I know we've all enjoyed Joel's speeches during his time in the club and we're really excited to hear his speech today. Um, and we look forward to seeing him progress um, in his course. Thank you, over to you, Joel. 
Thank you very much, Jackie. I really appreciate you serving, evaluating Joel's speech. Joel, oh, oh, and Linda, yes, it is a five to seven minute speech. Uh, one of the things that Joel joined the club was he wanted to have fun, which is one of the best reasons to join Toastmasters. And Joel just brings a sense of humor, uh, some wonderful insights, and I'm thrilled that he is here today to present from the presentation Mastery Path, a five to seven minute speech entitled, Dumb is Good. Dumb is Good, Joel Hefner. Can't hear you, Joel. I unmuted you. Okay. Dumb is good, and I can prove it. My proof started on a Sunday back in the early 1980s. My wife was reading the New York Times, and I was watching television in the next room. She would spend most of the day reading the Sunday Times, and I was only interested in the camera section that appeared on the Sunday's Times. She called to me and said, Joel, I have a job for you. At the time, I was a junior high school teacher who was also working part-time as a wedding photographer. My wife was looking through the Times to want that when she came across the description for a job. They were seeking an editor for a newsletter about Nikon cameras. Although I didn't think I was really interested in the job, I was intrigued at what they asked for. Instead of asking for a resume, they asked three specific questions on photography. And I knew the answers. I wrote out the answers using a typewriter Remember, this was pre-computer and pre-internet. I mailed it in, snail mail, of course. Weeks went by and I had forgotten about it. And then about six weeks later, I got a call from someone at Amphoto, the largest publisher of photography books at the time. They asked me to come in for an interview. The interview was with the editor-in-chief, Herb Taylor. I didn't realize that he was a very influential person in publishing. We chatted about photography. I told him that I owned Nikon cameras and was a part-time wedding photographer. And then he asked me a question that absolutely stunned me. He asked about my writing experience. I didn't have any. And even worse, I never even thought that that was necessary. I told him the only writing that I had ever done was writing worksheets for my students. Lame, but that's all I did. He told me that Amphoto and Kodak were jointly publishing an encyclopedia of practical photography, one volume at a time. They were in the process of completing the last volume and needed an article about wedding photography. He asked if I could do it as a sample. I, of course, agreed. I wrote the article and sent it in to him. A few weeks later, I got another call asking me to come in for an interview. This was getting interesting. I went back and he said that they read the article and they would be sending me a check as a contributor to the encyclopedia and that they would include my name as a contributing editor in the encyclopedia. It was like a dream that got even better. He told me that Amphoto was producing a series of books called the Amphoto Guide series. They needed someone to write a book about wedding photography. And he asked me if I could do it without hesitation. I said, no problem. He said he'd contact me with a, he would send a contract 
and introduced me to the editor who would be working on it. I went home and told my wife the news. And she asked, as every good wife would, can you really write the book? My answer to her was a bit different from my answer to him. I said, I have no idea. It took much longer than I thought to write, but I did it. The M Photo Guide to Wedding Photography came out in 1981 in hardcover. In a subsequent talk with Herb, he told me that it would be a good idea if some other writing credits could be uh, gotten by me. I never wrote an article. And he told me, I did, and I told him I didn't know anybody who I could send it to. He suggested that I write articles for the New York Times. Yikes. He gave me the contact information for the editor of the Sunday camera column. His name was Martin Hershenson and suggested I contact him. That was the column that I was reading in the Times when all this started. I did contact him and I suggested two articles. And they both ended up appearing in the Sunday New York Times. Without any qualifications, I became a published author and the writer of New York Times articles. Incidentally, remember the job that I applied for? I did ask about the job and he said, no, you're overqualified for it. Overqualified. I had never done anything like this. It was my first experience in writing. I know that people will do anything nowadays to become a published author. So I guess dumb was very good for me. And I would suggest try doing something dumb. It might work out for you too. Ooh, thank you so much, Joel. That was quite the story. You've had quite an adventure. And it is funny how you sometimes just tumble into things and learn a lot about yourself. Uh, so I, I, I wish Betsy was here for that speech. So I'm glad that we recorded it because she is all about everything having to do with cameras. So now we've finished our Part of, the, part of our meeting, which are prepared speeches, and we transition to table topics. These are spontaneous speeches of one to two minutes, Linda. So it'll be uh, green at one, yellow at 90 seconds, red at two, where you try to give a mini speech on a topic completely new to you that you might not have thought about. Uh, and this helps you think on your feet, and respond. I know in, on Senate staff, you're always being asked your opinions on various things and trying to lay everything out very quickly for your boss is an important skill that we try to practice here. And so I'm going to focus table topics today on regrets and the issue of regrets and regretting things. Two weeks ago we met and I felt on top of the world. The cherry blossoms were gonna come out. I had lots of things moving. And then I, in the last two weeks had three problems that I'm going to incorporate in today's tail topic, table topics. On, on Monday, I was giving a speech in my Nevada club on LIBOR, the London inner bank offer rate, when we were Zoom bombed by a couple of teenagers. And I had some regrets about that because we didn't, we let people in when I was speaking. And then instead of just kicking them out, I got kicked out and some other members. So I had some regrets about, okay, we need to think differently about how we handle Zoom bombers. And it seems that District 115 is having a real problem with Zoom bombers. And I started reading more about regret because some people think, well, you know, my, my motto is no regrets, just go forward. But that actually, 
is missing some points because regret can be very valuable. It can clarify you, it can instruct you, it can lift you up. It hurts, but addressing regret can make you feel better. And sometimes when you ponder past regrets, it can help you avoid future regrets. And dealing with regrets can help enhance your persistence, improve your strategic thinking and your performance. Uh, Elisa, do you have a plan for dealing with regrets, things you did or didn't do, or do you just move on with a motto of no regrets? Thank you for that great question and for this great theme about regrets. I think we all have them and we all deal with them in different ways. I wouldn't say that I have a plan about how to deal with regrets, but maybe I should. I'm a strategic planner in my day job. And sometimes I just leave all the planning to my day job and let it, my life just happen outside of my, my day job. I do think it's worth having a plan for how to deal with regrets so that you don't totally ignore them and don't learn from them, but you also do have the opportunity to move on and not dwell in them. And that's an important balance, which, which can be very hard to strike, especially if you're not thinking it through concretely. So perhaps coming out of this meeting, I will have more of a impetus to proffer up a plan for myself to deal with regrets and make sure that I'm, I'm learning from them and integrating them and using them to, to improve my life and my ability to contribute to, to everything I do. Back to you, Carol. Thank you so much, Elisa. One of the recommendations about regrets is that you should disclose your experiences. First of all, research says people like folks who disclose more, but it also helps to share what happened. It actually helps to talk or write about your regrets for a period of time, 10 to 15 minutes. It helps you get a better understanding and sort of avoids churning over the regret in your head over and over and over for years, keeping you up or making you feel anxious. Uh, Linda, do you try to process your experiences to glean lessons? Do you keep a journal or develop and give speeches about your life? Can you repeat the question again? Sure. And I can time for you if you'd like. Um, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm setting up here. So the question is, do you try to process your experiences to glean lessons? Do you keep a journal or develop and give speeches about lessons from your life? Well, thank you, Madam Table Topics Master and Postmaster. That is a very good question. Actually, I tend to be one of those people that spend too much time dwelling on maybe problems that I have or issues or regrets that I have on decisions that I made. So yes, I spend a lot of time processing things. <laughs> I probably overanalyze those types of things. I don't actually keep a journal, but I do spend a lot of time pondering things. And especially if I think that I have given offense to somebody, I'm always filled with regret if I think that I have offended someone. And sometimes it turns out that I haven't, but I think I have. <laughs> this is a little tiny thing that happened once I was traveling, I was really exhausted, got into my hotel, very late because the plane was delayed and I got into my hotel like at one in the morning at a different time zone as I was leaning against the elevator door going finally I've made it to my room I saw this bellhop carrying a bunch of suitcases rushing to catch the elevator and I went to push the button to hold the door open and instead I closed it and I went oh my goodness well, I went upstairs and for about a half an hour, I just thought he must think I'm the biggest jerk in the world. And I finally spent enough time thinking, what can I do about this? I called the front desk and I said, I don't know the name of that bellhop, but can you please tell him I accidentally closed the door on him when I meant to open it. And I spent probably way more time agonizing over this. And the, the front desk, woman who answered my phone went, oh, 
okay, I'll tell him that. And she laughed about it. And I thought, well, at least I've gotten that off my chest. I don't have to regret it all night and agonize about having offended this young man, fellow Toastmasters. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you, Linda. And you definitely come from a place of compassion. Tina Seelig, a ceiling, a Stanford professor recommends establishing, establishing a failure resume to track your professional failures, flops, and flubs. She says doing so in a strategic way can help you learn and move on without dwelling on mistakes. Joel, do you think a failure resume would help you professionally? Why or why not? Failure is a part of life. It's not good nor bad. I don't think that keeping track of it is of any particular use to anybody. In any given day, we fail. Others don't know about it, but we know about it. We may get up late. We may not make a call that we were supposed to. We may say something inadvertently that hurts someone's feelings. I don't think that failure is something to dwell upon. I'd much rather dwell upon successes and things that will happen or might happen in the future. Failure is in the past. Success is in the future. And I'm only interested in the future. I'm 74 years old. I don't care about what happened before. I care about what happens tomorrow, or if not tomorrow, five minutes from now. So I, I'm not too concerned with that particular topic. Thank you very much, Joel. And I appreciate you moving on and you've got a lot in the rear view mirror and focusing on the future. One of the things Linda uh, in her explanation, just the way she talked about it was something that they recommend is reframing your regret with self-compassion to try to avoid using terms of like contempt or, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Just try to avoid that. Just to acknowledge the error and speak kindly to yourself and speak to yourself as someone you, who you love and who you respect. So for me, since we last met two weeks ago, one of the things I do is take care of nature trails near my home and I pick up trash, I cut back leaves, I remove the vines that choke the trees. And usually I wear long pants, shirts, long shirts, sleeves, gloves, but a few weeks ago, I brought trimmers on my bike ride and wearing just bike shorts, shirts and gloves, I cut more vines off the trees as I rode. And I ended up with poison sumac with itchy red welts all over my hands, face, necks, legs, arms and torso. So that is another regret that I am having this week. Uh, my question is for Esteban, do you appreciate being out in nature? Is there a favorite place you like to go? Thank you, uh, Madam Toast Leader. Yes, there is a favorite place that I like to go. I like to go to Rock Creek Park. I like to walk around on the trails over there. And I like to hang out next to the creek itself and just watch you know, some of the water flowing. It's very, uh, it's not too deep. And I can get close to the water and see some of the wildlife as well. Uh, sometimes the dogs are out and people are throwing sticks and having them retrieve them and those types of things. As far as uh, regrets, uh, tying that in, I take an athlete's approach, having used to train martial arts for tournaments. I give them three, three strikes. Uh, when they make three mistakes, then they can start dwelling and feeling bad for themselves and then keep going because it makes no sense just to keep digging into yourself after you make one mistake. And then if they have to, if they think it's a big mistake and they can't meet the three, they can't wait through the three mistake threshold, then I give them 15 minutes, feel bad for themselves and solve and say, hey, why didn't I do this differently? And so similarly, I take that approach to work and try as best as I can. So to answer your question, though, I do enjoy being out in Rock Creek Park and walking the trails there about. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. I love Rock Creek Park as well. The park I go to, Fort DuPont, is the second largest national park in DC. 
Uh, experts in regret recommending describing the incident using third person pronouns like he or she or they, not first person pronouns like I or me. They say that using third person pronouns help you sharpen the way to reason through some difficulties. So on Tuesday, Carol had a half hour between meetings to get a COVID test, which I had promised Betsy I would get before she, Betsy had to fly. So I thought I'd get us one, she would be in good shape. So I ran down to the testing area. I was wearing some slippery work shoes I had, she hadn't worn in two years, so she lost her balance. Fell at the top of the stairs, rolled down about 10 stairs, head over heels, crashing to the bottom with her head on the landing. Some kind passersby helped her get back to her office and called the nurse where she went to urgent care for x-rays and is now in a boot using crutches for four to six weeks with some broken bones in her ankle, uh, bruised and jammed fingers and a variety of rug burns and bruises. So my question is for Claire, as you return to more of a public life, what are you doing to get more reacclimated to your old habits? Are you finding you're out of practice doing some things like in my case, walking in heels? Carol and fellow Toastmasters. I am having a, I realize I am having a difficult time in my own mind accepting that, yes, I'm vaccinated, boosted, wear a mask almost everywhere I go, even now, although that's not a requirement here in Nevada. Now, <clears throat> I still am in public indoor places, but I have anxiety that, oh, I'm going to go to a restaurant or an indoor place. Someone's invited me and I really want to go. I have anxiety the moment I take my mask off. I don't know if all these people are maybe vaccinated or not. They might have COVID. And unfortunately, with the new requirements, you can, I'm not sure, just wear a mask, even though you've been, you're positive. It's not good. But I would proffer my idea that it is difficult for me to acclimate myself to being indoors in public, even with people I know, but especially if I'm having to eat, which I'm a culinarian in retirement. I have a one-year certificate in culinary I love food, I love to cook, I love to eat chocolate, champagne, seafood, everything I love. But accepting the fact that I can take off my mask and eat in public, indoors, still difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I know we're all getting reacclimated to the new environment. My, my another question for, for Devaki, for Dev, have you ever come to someone's rescue? What happened and how did you feel afterwards? Oh, great question. This occurred uh, just last week. Uh, before I proffer my little anecdote, forgive me if I talk too fast because I get very excited. Um, I last week went to a friend of a friend's birthday party and I being um, DD, Devaki Dave, designated driver, it's my initials, <laughs> uh, being the only sober person ever in a room or at a party, um, offered to drive my fellows back. So uh, late night around, you know, 12 or 1230, we left the party fairly early because I'm old and I'm a party pooper. Um, so I, I left with my friend, I dropped her off at home, and she lives about five minutes from me. But after I dropped her off, I drove two blocks forward, and I heard a big crash or like 
crunching sound as if something heavy fell from the sky or I don't know. So I drive cautiously forward and at the intersection of, I think it was Rhode Island and whatever the cross street is, I'm new here, forgive me, but I knew I was on Rhode Island uh, somewhere and I saw a car, an SUV flipped over and I saw another white sedan like run into the traffic light. And so there were some pedestrians still there um, trying to figure out what's happening, just talking and shouting. And I like to call myself the Paw Patrol Rescue because my niece and nephew watch that show. Um, for some reason, when I see things going wrong, my first instinct is dial 911. I think, I guess even as a kid, even before there was an emergency, I kind of just dialed 911 to see what would happen. So I have my handy dandy phone, call 911 and immediately say, I'm on the intersection of Rhode Island and whatever, and a black SUV has just flipped over um, on the driver's side. And I get out of my car, leave my car door open in this new city where I moved, where I'm told carjackings are rampant, leave my car door open, my blinkers on to block traffic and um, start, you know, describing to the dispatcher everything that's going on. Um, I was like, okay, let me tell you, it's a Maryland license plate and there's one passenger in the car. And the woman in the car was miraculously rescued um, by a passerby who was helping her extract her from the window before the EMT got there. But anyway, there was somehow a way I could be involved in the rescue without using physical strength, which I have none. Um, I was able to at least call 911 and get the ambulance and fire and dispatch there. Wow, thank you, Deb. That is quite a heroic story and glad you were there sober and compassionate and able to, to help that, that woman. What a, what a terrible experience for her. I proffer my, I call myself Duber driver, I drive. <laughs> For my friends, I am. I can be your duper. <laughs> Love that. Um, the one of the other recommendations with regret is to extract a lesson instead of plunging into the depths. Rather, it's better to self-distant, zoom out, and see the details when you're not enmeshed. Um, accepting, acknowledging, and forgiving from a little bit of afar, either things undone, the inaction path, um, have the hardest regrets. But even things that you did do and you regret, it's better to sort of Think of yourself as a neutral expert, writing an email or a prescription to yourself, sort of just telling you how to handle it, accepting, acknowledging, and forgiveness. This cognitive appraisal, what they recommend is called REACH, and REACH has five, five different things, uh, recalling the hurt and facing it, be empathetic, kind, and compassionate, altruistic, offer forgiveness to oneself, commit publicly, sharing your lessons about, you know, don't run in high heels, you're going to cut down vines in the woods, wear long pants and gloves, and hold on and stay true to your decisions and forgive yourself. Jackie, my question for you is, has this focus on better addressing regret been helpful to you? Will it change how you talk to yourself or a loved one? Thank you, Madame Toast Leader. This, while I haven't used that system in the past, I look forward to using it in the future, particularly because taking a third person view of, of regrets would help take away the shame and uncomfortableness of the regret and allow me to develop a way to work on the, to resolve any issues that led to the regret to begin with. Thank you, Madame Toast Leader. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, and I know when you work on Capitol Hill, you're trying to be an expert on something every seven minutes that you just learned about. And so you do have regrets when you, you write a letter, or you write a memo, and then you think, oh, I forgot that thing, I forgot the thing. But you just gotta kind of move on. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our general evaluator, Elisa to lead us through the next portion of our meeting. Elisa. Thank you very much, Carol, and for those great table topic prompts and teaching us about different ways to deal with regret. We're now in the evaluation portion of the meeting where we have a chance to see how we did and get tips for future, future speeches and meetings. We will start with speech evaluations and our first speech evaluator today is um, evaluating Devaki's speech. The evaluator is Leslie Brooks and the evaluation time is from two to three minutes. Leslie, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Deb, I really, really enjoyed your speech. You definitely excelled at capturing our attention right off the bat by utilizing the word of the day. So kudos to you for that. You didn't use any filler words. You had good eye contact and you're really quite clear. So those were all wonderful, especially for your icebreaker speech. And it didn't even look like you were reading from anything. So that's quite impressive because you gave quite a bit of detail. I proffer that you ease a little bit slower into the story or maybe at um, transition moments. It's very possible that I was just overwhelmed in trying to be your evaluator, that it took me a moment to really understand the direction of it. But once I did, it was a really wonderful story. Um, I love that you used a different person's lived experience to kind of relate to your own and to transition us into getting to know you better. And I thought that that was really wonderful um, and a challenging thing to do. So kudos to you for that. As far as your vocal variety, I think at the beginning of the speech, you were talking faster and it was likely just nerves. And that probably also contributed to me having a difficult time understanding the direction at the beginning. But then once you got comfortable and got into your groove, you slowed down, you had impactful pauses, and you it was a good steady um, pace. So, so overall, great speech, especially for your first one and an icebreaker speech. And um, I look forward to hearing more from you. Great, thank you so much, Leslie, for that great evaluation. Our next evaluator is evaluating Joel's speech and our evaluator is Jackie. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Joel, I loved your speech. It, you are an incredible storyteller and the way you were able to integrate your application to the job, to writing a book, to writing a New York Times article, to tying it together why dumb is good and, and then you also were able to bring us all in by telling us to try something dumb because it worked out so well for you, it was incredible. Besides the content, I loved your tone. Um, you, you really had a great pace and it was just an incredible story which led to an incredible speech, wonderful job. Back to you. Great, thank you very much, Jackie, for that great evaluation. Our next speaker will be our timer who will tell us how we did on, on timing today. And I will turn it over to Linda for that. Thank you very much, Madam General Evaluator. For our speeches, Devaki spoke for six minutes and 39 seconds and Joel spoke for six minutes and 46 seconds. On the table topics, Elisa spoke for one minute, eight seconds. I will ask Carol what I spoke for. Do you... uh, two minutes, 14 seconds. Thank you. And Joel spoke for one minute and seven seconds. Esteban was one minute, 18 seconds. Claire was two minutes, 10 seconds. Devik, he spoke for two minutes and 28 seconds, and Jackie spoke for 27 seconds. As far as our evaluators go, they, Leslie spoke for one minute, 54 seconds, and Jackie spoke for 49 seconds. Great, thank you very much, Linda. I believe now we have our word of the day split out from our grammarian. So if that's correct, I will turn it over to Esteban for, to report out on the word of the day. It's over to you. Thank you, Elisa. The team, the Toastmaster team today did a good job using the word of the day, which was proffer. And we have a total usage of seven times for the whole team. Devaki with three times, Carol once, Elisa once, Claire once, and Leslie wants. Thank you very much for using this word and I hope you find it useful in your everyday work. 
Great, thank you very much, Esteban, for tracking that and for, for choosing the word. Now I will turn it over to our grammarian, Claire, to tell us how we did on grammar and filler words. Thank you very much. Normally I have my little printout sheet so I can just check, check, check. Today, not having that, I'm going to give it in order rather than person by person. Elisa used and several times. I loved her word, her usage of concretely and impetus. Linda used well one time, dwelling, overanalyze, agonizing over this, loved the, the verbiage. Joel, inadvertently. Esteban used and quite a few times, six or seven, and uh, try to remember not to pause rather than and, and, and. That's one thing I've learned to do. I can't comment on myself. Devaki used ah twice, um four times, and three times, but I love your Paw Patrol rescue and extracted or extractor. That was great. Leslie used in your evaluation, use and three times um, one so. I loved your transition moments. Jackie, in your evaluation, did fine because it was very short. That's another help. <laughs> I did like uh, Devaki's also used and quite a few times. I love your cobblestone streaks, streets, harrowing, turbulent childhood, suburban Texas, one humanity. You work with that vocabulary. You've got it. Thank you so much. Leslie, an um, Jacqueline, a couple of ums, Elisa, and Carol, you've spoken quite a bit, but very few filler words. You, you, yes, yes, you've used the pondering our past regrets, glean, and then there was something cognitive, something that was an alliteration, but I didn't get the second word, but I love that phrase. Joel, I enjoyed your having you in front of your title and your background, et cetera. That really helped. You use snail mail, lame. One so you, Joel, you've got down speaking without filler words. My grammarian report of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. I will now give my overall evaluation for this meeting. Overall, this was a great meeting. Really good use, as, as Esteban mentioned, of the word of the day from many different speakers in many different ways. We heard some great inspiring stories from rescuing someone from a car to getting published in the New York Times to going above and beyond due to an elevator misunderstanding. And it's really fun to have a theme for the meeting that brings these types of stories to the fore. So great job on that, Carol. There's a common theme I've noticed to a lot of these meetings where people 
talk about contributing, learning, overcoming challenges, different types of inspirational stories that we all bring to this space. And I really appreciate that. And today was no different. Our speakers today had two great topics, very different, but again, really in this inspirational theme that, that I've seen a lot of here. For table topics, I like the range of topics. I like that you made us think on our feet in a way that was really thoughtful and you you had some personal examples and you had some research and and suggestions and and it was a really nice mix uh, the grammarian clary did a really nice job saying the filler words and and mistakes that we made and also the good things that that we did so that we can focus on building on the good and and trying to reduce the less good the word of the day also great job tracking all that and, and letting us know when we did that so thank you for for that and and also for the timer great job and it's really great to have the full color do your screen i don't know how you do it but i really appreciate that so thank you um our evaluators great job you're both very engaging very positive you have a smile on your face which both of you which is really hard for me to do when i'm thinking at the same time so <laughs> congratulations for that leslie you were very engaging you had really good specifics on the speech and focusing on things like the pacing the word of the day and that was that was fantastic there was one thing you did where you said you started off really fast but it's possible i was just overwhelmed and wasn't paying attention i would suggest even though i do this all the time not undermining your point but just saying you started off really fast and that can sometimes be hard if, if people are trying to trying to keep up with with the start of your speech something like that so it kind of generalizes it and doesn't doesn't diminish your point but great work and i think both of the evaluations were just a little bit on the shorter side so i have the opposite problem i always go too long so maybe have one or two additional points as a backup if you see that you're still you haven't gotten to the green yet just so that you can fill that out a bit more but really great work great evaluations and you got to the point quickly which is which is also excellent Finally, Toast Leader, uh, Carol, you did a great job today, as always, a really great topic, the value of regret, bringing positive and negative together and making us really think. Um, you brought in great specific examples and your own stories, so thank you for sharing that. And so sorry about your foot, that just sounds like the occupational hazard of heels, which we should just abolish, but I hope you feel better soon, and, and I'm very sorry that happened. Great job, as always, getting people to fill roles and being willing to jump, get people to jump in and think on their feet, which is really the point of Toastmasters. So I will stop there, but again, I have a lot of compliments to give all around because it was a great meeting and I will turn it back over to you, Carol. <laughs>